Okay, so here's another funny, interesting thing. Um, I saw this like little short talk by Michael Knowles and the activists with the Black Lives Matter or something, and they were like trying to debate is America racist. Now I'm just gonna read this um article to you guys because I think it's interesting. The achievement gap in Berkeley schools has long been among the nation's very worst. BUSD has spent, I, so I'm from, this is the town that I grew up in, that we have like a university there, like UC Berkeley. Um, they've got like a picture of Berkeley High School, like that's where I went to high school. BUSD has spent decades striving to close the gap between black and Latino students and their white and Asian peers but has yielded only limited success. So this was written August 30th, 2023. Okay, a team of top education researchers at Stanford University analyzed nearly a decade's worth of test score data, attempting to understand the gap that separated the results of white students from Asian, Black, and Latino students nationwide. Their study of scores from students in third through eighth grade from 2009 to 2018 at BUSD just through 2016 found yawning gaps in reading and math scores at schools across the country. But Berkeley Unified stood out more than nearly any other. Among the nation's 5,000 largest districts, it had the second largest gap in scores behind only Washington, D.C. Five grade levels levels separated the reading and math scores of white and black students in Berkeley. White students scored three grade levels above the national average in English and math, while black students scored two grade levels below. That's a lot. There's like a little chart there. Hmm. For white and Latino students, the achievement gap, now often called the opportunity gap, uh, referring to the difference in educational opportunities available to students of different backgrounds, spanned almost four years, among the very worst nationally. Wow. Asian students also scored below white students while performing about one grade level above the national average. For close observers of the school district, the results would not be surprising. It's a district where children of professors rub shoulders with those whose families have been living below the poverty line for generations. That's true. The opportunity gap continues to dominate Berkeley schools, board races, budget decisions, and superintendent priorities as it has for decades. In 1968, the district cemented its progressive reputation by becoming one of the first to voluntarily integrate its schools, intending to end unequal opportunities for its students. But the differing outcomes for students have stubbornly persisted, haunting each subsequent superintendent to take the helm, each pursuing myriad initiatives designed to improve outcomes for the lowest performing students. Our values say that we believe in educating all students, but our data doesn't necessarily necessarily reflect that, said the school board director, Khadijah Brown, an 09 Berkeley High grad. I went to, hmm, never mind. Ty Dickinson, a 2021 Berkeley High School graduate, put it this way, the progressive ideals enshrined in the school district's policy books, he thinks, have little to do with whether students feel supported by their teachers at school. You can talk about how you change this and that policy, but it's not really enacted. It doesn't really make a difference, Dickinson said. It's difficult to determine how BUSD's achievement gap has changed over the last 50 years, owing to a lack of historical data that's easy to compare across time. In general, Black and Latino students across the United States caught up substantially to white students between 1970 and 1990, but progress has been uneven since. So there's some program, there's a picture, and it's like some student from a program called RISE, which prepares low-income students for college. 
Over the years that the study spanned, scores for black Berkeley students slid. The gap was wider in 2016 than it was in 2009, and scores for Latino and Asian students improved during that time. Race is just one way to cut the data. Students with disabilities, those who are homeless or in foster care, and th those learning English also struggle at schools nationwide and in Berkeley, though the Stanford data doesn't offer the same kind of analysis for those student groups. Today, today there are some signs the achievement gap in Berkeley is no longer quite so grim as illustrated in the Stanford study, but as the number of low income and black students in the school district shrinks each year, black students make up about 13% of the BUSD population today, down from 43% in the 1990s, and the results became more difficult to interpret. They literally lost 30% of their students. That's insane. Um, a new study by the Stanford team, for example, no longer includes students for black in no longer includes scores for black students because the sample size is too small. Um, so I I want to just highlight this for a moment because it's kind of what I've been talking about. The birth rate of black Americans is declining at such an intense rate. There's nobody being born. <laughs> You can sit here and look on Instagram all day long and watch Sierra's pregnancy or watch whoever else currently has a baby. The reality is women like me, women like all of the black influencers that you are seeing on YouTube, we're like very small channels. Most likely like we're not going to have children. And we're going to choose not some of some of us will don't get me wrong, maybe like what 2% or something will. But also a lot of the other black women that you see on here who are content creators are not in America. The, they're black content creators who are in Europe. Okay, maybe I, I know like like um, Segan is in Canada. Lillian is now in Manchester. <laughs> other content creators are literally in Africa. We're talking about black Americans in America, especially in the metropolitan cities like New York and California. There are none. Black women who are growing up there, their lives are so difficult and so miserable. They are legitimately aborting all black life. The sample size went from 40% to 13% and became so small, Stanford could, didn't even have any more data. I, I, keep, I keep trying to say this. I'm not going to scream it from any rooftops anymore. I think that, like, I think it's sad, um, but I am not surprised and I don't think that there was anything that was going to stop it at this point I think it was like God's plan um even as the pandemic set across the country back black Latino and Asian students in Berkeley did a bit better in reading those scores fell in math for most student groups in 2022 30 percent of black students in Berkeley met reading state standards up from 27% in 2019, the same year 83% of white students did. Data for last year's state test scores are not yet available, but in a presentation at the end of her first year as superintendent, Anika Ford Morthel struck a hopeful tone backed by a promising internal data in elementary school reading scores. I want there to be a day we can ask, how are the children and each other in Berkeley and truly answer all the children are well, Ford Mothel said at the presentation re referencing a traditional Mazai proverb she routinely uses at school board, meet board meetings. They are not all well yet, but they are a whole lot better because of our collaboration. This isn't true. Still, the stubborn gaps in test scores at Berkeley schools beg answers to the fundamental questions facing education. Why are black and Latino students still performing so far below their Asian and white peers? To what extent are test scores a mirror for the inequality and structural racism permeating American society? How and for what should school and district leaders be held accountable for? Integrating Berkeley schools failed to close the opportunity gap. In 1968, Superintendent Neil Sullivan reported on staggering on the staggering achievement gap. The top quarter of Berkeley eighth graders scored in the top 1% in the nation. The top half scored in the top 3%, the bottom quarter in the bottom 14%. 
that data published in a report to the school's board became the impetus for Berkeley's decision to voluntarily integrate. The large discrepancies between the results achieved at different schools represent a serious challenge to the concept of equality of educational opportunity the Committee on Integration wrote in its 1660, 1968 report. The initial years following integration were tumultuous, filled with racial tension as well as optimism that scores would rise. But integration turned out not to be a silver bullet for closing the opportunity gap. By 1972, school board director Mary Jane Johnson warned of a full-blown rebellion by black parents who were furious with the district over black students' poor performance on standardized tests. If black kids and Chicanos can't make it in this community, Johnson, who was black, told the San Francisco Examiner, they can't make it anywhere. Facts. Articles in regional newspapers assess Berkeley's so-called integration experiment with skepticism. The Examiner concluded in 1981 that integration had made it possible for some exceptional black and Latino students to excel, but scores rem- Uh, remained unchanged for the vast majority. One effort to close the achievement gap included the work of Pedro Nogueira, who served on the Berkeley School Board from 1990 to 1994, whose son graduated from Berkeley High and who was the Dean of Education at the University of Southern California. In 1996, a team of researchers led by Nogueira started what they termed the Diversity Project at Berkeley High using research to raise awareness about the achievement gap. At the end of six years, the researchers felt they had made progress, but the gap persisted. Despite the optimism that led us to believe that Berkeley High School could be a place where racial disparities and achievement could be reduced through school change, we did not achieve our goals, Nagara reflected in his project in the, un- in the book Unfinished Business. If black kids and Chicanos can't make it in this community, they can't make it anywhere. Mary Jane Johnson, Berkeley School Board Director in 1972. By 2000, the statistics were still appalling. This time, the top 47% of Berkeley students ranked in the top 25% in the nation. However, not one black student ranked in the top quartile and 70% were in the lowest 25% nationally, according to data shared at a meeting of parents of children of African descent, which had formed to agitate the school district to do more about the results. In desegregating schools in in 1968, we thought all we had to do was mix everybody up to assure equality. The school board president, Shirley Issel told the Los Angeles Times in 2002, we were so naive. To achieve the dream of public education as the great equalizer, we have to work a lot harder than we thought and work they did. In the last two decades, the district has implemented a flurry of initiatives designed to improve the scores of black and Latino students. District leaders identified internal structures that they thought reproduced inequality. The district added small schools at Berkeley High, hoping to foster supportive communities and the universal ninth grade. There was a campaign to raise attendance, efforts to reduce suspension rates for black students and reduce tracking, culturally affirming programs like Umoja, Puente, and the Talented Tenth, the growth of career and technical education classes and programs to get students to college like Bridge and Rise, the establishing and expansion of the Office of Family Engagement and Equity. Parents have formed advocacy groups like Parents of Children of African Descent and Latinos Unidos de Berkeley to hold the district accountable for educating their students. And the city has put its weight behind the issue to attempting to address the achievement gap in its 2020 vision. And after all these efforts, the gap persists. Early discourse around achievement gaps was rooted in racist pseudoscience. As efforts to address the achievement gap were underway, so was a fierce debate about the root cause of it. Why in a city that believes so staunchly in equality is this problem so persistent? 
The debate carried on with fervor in boardrooms, ivory towers, and kitchen tables. Some in Berkeley blamed children's families, others blamed the school district. Meanwhile, academics laid out statistical arguments attributing poor academic outcomes to poverty and parent education. The origins of dis discourse around racial achievement gaps date back to the 19th century when pseudoscientists measured the size of human skulls and attributed the differences to genetic inferiority. Scientific racism was used to explain differences in everything from IQ to health outcomes. Debunked in the 20th century, the arguments morphed into social justification for the low test scores of non-white students and resurfaced with books like Charles Murray's The Bell Curve. People who hold these ideas believe that inequality in test scores is fundamentally the result of deficits inherent to black and brown people. That explanation shifted away from genetics to the cultural deficit argument that was popular in American discourse through Barack Obama's presidency. Some in Berkeley put the responsibility of low test scores on parents who don't care. This has increasingly fallen out of fashion in Berkeley. It's been a really long time since I've heard anybody blame their families, which is how it originally started, said Dana Morgan, an ethnic studies teacher at Berkeley High since 1993. Still the case is still made in anonymous comments on Berkeley side articles. Data shows that family wealth tracks closely to academic performance. As these arguments were unfolding, a growing body of research was developed that linked test scores with socioeconomic status, parents' education, and children's achievement in school. When it comes to economic inequality, Berkeley is particularly unequal. The median household, the median white household in Berkeley earns $128,000 per year compared with $68,000 for Asian households and $67,000 for Latino households and $43,000 for the median black household. About 80% of every white and Asian adult in Berkeley have a bachelor's degree compared with half of Latino adults and 29% of black adults. Together, these factors fundamentally shape children's lives from how much their parents read to them to how much chronic stress they experience on a daily basis. It means the difference between a parent who can pay for private tutoring for their struggling child and a parent who is struggling to put food on the table. Racism separate from class also leaves a mark on children's ability to perform in school. Research shows in Berkeley, Family income tracks neatly onto student academic performance. In 2000, students from the zip codes with the wealthiest families had the highest GPAs, and the reverse was true too. The wealthier the neighborhood, the better the students' grades, with few exceptions. Analyzing hundreds of millions of standardized test scores for American schools from 2009 to, th to 2018, the Stanford researchers found the same trends were true at schools across the country. Their research found that parents' income and educational levels, as well as parents, as well as patterns of racial and ethnic segregation, were by far the most significant factors in shaping achievement gaps. Most schools with large gaps in test scores were not integrated like Berkeley. The Stanford researchers found school segregation to be the most important predictor of achievement gaps, but Berkeley, like districts in Evanston, Illinois, Chapel Hill, North, North Carolina, and Menlo Park, was an outlier in this trend. School districts with the smallest achievement gaps between students of different races tended to be places where all students performed poorly. The exceptions tended to be school districts serving wealthy students. The best test scores for Latino students in the country came from Briar Hill Manor Union Free School in Westchester, where 4% of the student body is low income. Of the largest 464 districts in California, there were none where black students performed more than one grade level above the national average, but schools in wealthy enclaves like Orinda and Los Altos came the closest. Piedmont is an affluent city carved out of Oakland and is the only school district among the, among the state's 772 largest where Latino students score two grade levels above the national average. In Berkeley, while black students score below grade level on average, it's the extremely high scores of white students that explain Berkeley's exceptional achievement gap. 
In Oakland, San Francisco, Los- and Los Angeles, black students are slightly further behind than they are in Berkeley, but white students are not as far ahead as they are here. In his 2004 book, Race in Class, academic R- Richard Rothenstein looked at the, di- the, da- the data and concluded, the influence of social class characteristics is probably so powerful that schools cannot overcome it no matter how well-trained are their teachers and no matter how well designed are their instructional programs and climates. While the data is undisputed, Rothenstein's conclusion is far more controversial and a huge portion of education research is devoted to the study of what schools can do to fix unequal outcomes. Um, This article, it goes on, it's very long. I'm going to put it in the description box if you want to continue to read it. um, Feel free. Maybe I'll come back and read aloud the next part of it. But there's just some other things I want to cover tonight. So, yeah.